and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share a conversation with you that I had with John Kolko. He's the author of the new book, Creative Clarity, a practical guide for bringing creative thinking into your company. Before you jump off, if you're a solo business owner or a small business owner, this applies to you. If you're in any type of creative work, and we are using that term broadly, anybody who does any kind of creative problem solving is creative. And if you go with that perspective into this conversation, you're going to get something out of it, especially if you lead a creative team, you're part of a creative team, or if you're higher up and you want the teams that work for you to be more creative, there's something in this conversation for everybody. There's actually even some controversial things in this conversation, I would say. I listened back to the conversation. I found some stuff that I agree with and some stuff that I I'm like, you know what? I agreed with it in the moment, and now I'm kind of like second guessing it. And that's a good thing because there's no one right answer for this conversation and what it brings up in terms of creating a creative community inside of your organization. And all organizations have different culture and are going to approach this differently. I encourage you to intentionally listen to this episode and see what you think about some of the ideas in this conversation. And then go over to the show notes at beyondthetodolist.com slash 228. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think about some of the ideas in this conversation. And with that, I'll get out of the way and enjoy. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, John Colco. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. So you came out with a book, and this is a really kind of cool, unique uh, angle and even topic for this show. The book is called Creative Clarity, a practical guide for bringing creative thinking into your company. And this fits in great with a productivity show because honestly, there's a lot of people out there who need to be productive and produce things, which is, you know, what creating is, is all about. But putting that inside of the whole company, having a creative culture even, That can be a daunting task, right? Yeah, it's hard. It's interesting. A lot of the clients and partners that we deal with in Modernist Studio uh, suffer from sort of the ability to bring that creativity into their organizations because they're at a they're at sort of an upper level of management and they're risk averse. Uh, And so when you start talking about you know creativity, I think a lot of people think about like Nerf darts and all that kind of crap. You know, beer and (laughs) beer at the office and stuff. And you know, maybe it's about that, but it really is about taking risks. You know, anytime you create something new, uh, you are you're you're taking a risk that it will be accepted. And when you're talking about a product or a service, that acceptance means it'll it'll either sell or it won't. Uh, and so, you know, I think a lot of that that sort of management level, you know, director level, struggle with the idea of wanting to do new things and really worrying about that risk. I think that it's hilarious that you bring up Nerf darts and beer because I think that's when people hear, Hey, let's, let's get the team to get creative. It's like, okay, cool. Let's just, let's give them fun, like <laughs> scooters to ride around in and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's really less of a tangible thing. It's more of a perspective change, right? Yeah, it is. In fact, that sort of mentality, you know, that sort of valley. You know, uh, I don't know, visualization actually does a disservice, I think, to people doing serious work, um, because, you know, now if you say, you know, I want to bring creativity and, and be more like a startup in my company, that's kind of what management imagines. Um, and they're like, we don't we don't really want that. You know, we're at a staid conservative industry. We don't need nerf. <laughs> But but yeah, it is sort of antithetical to the idea of getting real hard work done. You know, it's a process. Uh, creativity for me is more of a process and a mindset, um, like you said, than than really sort of a visualization or mannerisms. Um, I think it's really about instilling a culture where people can take those risks that I talked about, but then can also uh, have criticism and critique from the other, you know, from their coworkers and have trust with one another so that ideas can come to fruition and and sort of, um, you know, get better and better without people starting to take that criticism personally. It really is a mindset. You hit the nail on the head right there with it being not a personal thing. It's kind of this idea of, hey, you told me to be creative. I was creative. I brought you an idea and then you shot it down. So do you think you're going (laughs) to do you think you're going to get more ideas out of me now? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And so, you know, there's actually a little bit of a tension there because, um, you know, getting your ideas shot down sucks. It doesn't feel very good. At the same time, creativity in sort of a, a professional sense requires iteration and that iteration needs feedback from a variety of perspectives. And so the idea of, of building a culture of critique means that you have to understand what critique is 
um, I think of it as a, as a really specific form of meeting or experience. And when I, you know, when I work with um, some of my uh, my staff on what a critique is, we actually treat it in a really unique way. We'll sort of gather as a group, you know, just like a, a meeting. We'll we'll present work, and so so even from the beginning, that's a little different because you actually have to have a work product. And then we'll talk about what is good and bad about it. And the person whose work it is doesn't talk. They're not allowed to defend their work or explain it or rationalize it. They take notes. And sure, they can, you know, if people don't get it, they can sort of talk through, you know, what's going on. But, uh, but for, by and large, they're, they're silent. Um, and that means that they're allowed to sort of reflect on everything that's going on. Um, and then later, they can prune the feedback and they could say, you know what, I, I don't agree with half of this and I'm just not going to do it. Um, and so it shifts the idea of judgment and sort of reactivity. And so those things can come later when the person who's having their work critique can reflect on it. It allows somebody to sort of reflect on that in a more objective way. So they're there as more of an observer taking notes of what's being said about the work. And it's less about them personally, as hard as it can be for somebody to disconnect themselves from the work that they've done, because, you know, hey, it's my baby or whatever you want to call it. You know, it's that kind of a mentality for them, right? But how do you get somebody to get into that mindset to appropriately approach it that way as they're being critiqued? You know, you're totally right. Um, it, it is sort of really hard to, you know, get over your baby, right? Sometimes it's called you got to kill your babies or kill your right. darlings, which is you know, kind of crass. But um, but so so you mentioned, you know, or you questioned, how do you get somebody in that mindset? And that's where the idea of trust comes in. And um, typically, you don't talk about trust in a corporate setting, with the exception of like you go on a team build and maybe you do one of these like group falls where <laughs> you land on each <laughs> other, and that's the start and the end of the idea of trust in a large organization. But really, trust means that um, when somebody delivers criticism, you view it objectively as if they're coming from the right place, that they're critiquing the work, they're not critiquing you. Um, and I think that's a really big difference. That's something that uh, takes some practice to get used to. Uh, it takes some practice to deliver as well. It means that you've got to judge your language better, and you have to be a little bit more objective and careful in what you say. And so if you say things like, um, you know, you didn't do a good job, that's really different than this isn't working. You know, it's a subtlety, but it really matters. Um, on the other side of things, it means that I, I need to believe in you as a leader, that you actually know what you're talking about. And that means that you as a leader need to show me your competence. Um, if we're talking about a design sense or in a computer science, you know, programming development sense, I need to know you can actually design or that you can code. Uh, because those are things that are going to help me believe your credibility, listen to you when you offer that criticism and trust your feedback. I hadn't thought about it coming from that direction of it's not just about putting the person getting critiqued. We'll see. And, and there I go. I just said it. It's like the person getting critiqued. It's not the person. It's the the work. But it's about, again, putting that person's state of mind in the right place. But it's not just about that person. It's also all about the people critiquing that they also need to be set up properly in terms of this is how we do a critique. And you're to address the work, not the worker. Yeah, that's that's totally right. And, um, you know, there's a there's an interesting way that you can think about if you want to start to bring this into your organization, if you are in a decision making capacity, um, which is, you know, it's always good to lead by example. Well, if you want to learn how to give a critique, it's helpful to then receive one. Um, and your work product doesn't have to be, you know, wireframes or comps or code or product management documents, they can be things like business plans or accounting spreadsheets or project, uh, you know, Gantt charts, like any artifact can be critiqued. And so imagine that you're, you know, in the C-suite, um, rather than dictating things, what would it mean to put your work on the wall, whatever your work product is, uh, step back and listen to other people talk about it. It's really, really tempting to defend it, particularly if you're a um, you know, you're a uh, influential leader and you're viewed as a leader. It's really tempting to go defend it and explain it and rationalize it. Um, and I think it's a good way to build empathy with your team um, by actually putting yourself in that position. Um, it's also really interesting to see how a meeting shifts when explicitly you're asking for people to point out what's wrong with the thing you made. Um, and at first, when you talk, you know, when you when you have a director or a manager do this, people are really reluctant to point bad things out. 
Um, but the meeting doesn't really go anywhere if the person's being quiet and you're reluctant to point anything out. And at some point, the silence sort of gets to you and it, you know, it just starts to roll. Somebody says something like, well, you know, when you when you talked about that acquisition, you really didn't think through these, you know, the, the how we're going to deal with the current staff and, you know, what's the what's the reorg going to look like? And, you know, suddenly people are talking about strategy through a lens of criticism, just like they would, you know, a visual design product. When we hear the word critique, we often think of criticism and we think of that being a negative thing. But is it's not all just about saying, well, here's what's wrong with this thing. Uh, I, I would assume that part of it would also entail giving some affirmations of, hey, this this is great. You know, it's interesting, actually. I dissuade when I'm teaching. I dissuade my students from offering compliments. But we don't just offer negative criticism. You also have to offer a suggested solution. Um, and gotcha. that needs to come across not just in words. You need to draw it or build it or model it or represent it somehow so that it's not just at a 20,000 foot level. And so if we you know, continue to run with that idea of, hey, we're critiquing an M&A strategy. Um, if, if I say, you know, you haven't thought about the organizational structure of how you're going to integrate these new people into our company, let me show you one solution. I'll grab a whiteboard marker, jump on the whiteboard and start to sketch out what that, you know, maybe that reorg might look like. Um, and so I'm being constructive. It's called constructive criticism for a reason. And then what's, what's um, unique about this form of feedback is that the person listening and carefully taking notes and taking pictures of the whiteboard goes away and later they can say, you know what, that's garbage. I don't agree with that at all. I'm not doing anything that they said. And that's totally up to them, too. That's sort of the other half of this. Where does this trust come from is that um, if I'm going to participate in critique, I then need to be empowered to make decisions based on that content myself. Um, and not everything in an organization is you know, autonomous. Obviously, there's other people who influence things and are decision makers. But for the most part, I need to have runway to then pick and choose my feedback um, and so if I heard somebody, you know, saw somebody draw on a whiteboard, a new organizational model, I go back to my desk, I think about it critically, and I say, I'm not doing that. And that's got to be just okay. I mean, these things don't happen magically either. Um, everything we just described is super hard. And I think that's, you know, one of the reasons companies struggle with this type of thing. It's a culture change. And just saying, okay, now we're going to have critique. You know, that doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, you need to train people on how to do it. You need to literally give them mechanisms and scripts and things like that to follow, just like any new skill. But then you need to, again, show through example that it's okay. And it's okay to do these things. And I think that comes bottom up and top down. Um, bottom up, individual contributors need to feel comfortable you know, showing their work and calling these meetings to order and saying, hey, we're going to have a critique. It's something special. It's not just a it's not just a PowerPoint presentation. Here's what's going to happen. And then, you know, sort of that top down level, a director, or a creative director or, a, you know, a dev lead needs to say, OK, you know, Thursdays at noon, we're having critique every single Thursday. Um, and that's one of the things that I brought to a lot of the companies that I've worked with is sort of having that regular cadence to it starts to instill it as part of that culture. You know, it starts to say this isn't an anomaly. It's just something we do. Um, and it, at some point, it actually transcends the meeting, which gets pretty cool. Um, if companies do embrace it, then, you know, it might be, hey, come over to my desk, and give me a critique on this. Um, and the same rules apply, you know, the same sort of mentality and style of you know, be quiet, don't defend your work, take notes. But it doesn't have to be this this massive meeting. Um, and I think a, an organization can really claim, uh, claim some sort of creative essence um, when they've gotten to that place where people are actively asking for critique in casual settings. Now, you said uh, a bit ago this leading by example, and uh, I think th does that make sense then to as you're starting to institute some of these cultural changes for the people in leadership to say, all right, look, I'll step in and I'll be the first to get critiqued and I will show you one how to be critiqued, but then also how to maybe afterwards say I'll critique your critique or something along those lines. Yeah, totally. That's exactly right. Um, and, you know, when I teach this stuff in school, either to, to grad students or to actually an executive training, um, we'll, we'll often film the critique. Um, and so, you know, we'll actually like, we'll, we'll do it, a regular meeting, we'll film it, and then we'll play back the, uh, the tape. And, you know, we'll, to, to your point, critique the critique. We'll, we'll say things like, well, right here, you were talking about the person. Um, and you can actually see the person's body language that they shut down. Um, so let's sort of role play out what would have been better ways of framing, you know, your your criticism or your feedback. And that really starts to, I, I think, to your point, give evidence for how things work, how things should work. And it's almost like a mini guidebook then. Um, it, it becomes a little bit sort of like autotelic. Like these are just the things I do and just the things I say. 
As you're working this process, this critique process into your workplace as uh, honestly, just one of the many elements of a creative culture, how do you then deal with people aren't quite getting it when you, you know, I mean, I, like we said, you can critique the critique and people start to understand it more. But the whole thing that comes down to when like people have emotions in the workplace, people are people. So and we're not all the same. So how do you kind of move everybody as a whole forward into instituting these new creative culture elements? You know, I think the, the idea of people have emotions is actually really important to underscore in a creative culture. Um, and, you know, one of the techniques that I've used that helps people come to terms with that, um, which which is going to sound very sort of um, blunt, is get rid of all the rules. Let me explain a little bit of what I mean. When you first hear something like that, I think people, again, think of those Nerf darts, right? They're like, the inmates are running the asylum and it's chaos. And there's <laughs> no, you know, there's no control op- over it. But I, I kind of mean removing... Uh, conservative um, policies that are in place just because they've always been in place. And some of those actually are things like, well, you can't bring your dogs to work. You can't sleep under your desk. You can't drink at your desk. Like these these sort of rules that have been ingrained. And some of them are more uh, institutional in different industries. And I'll give you a very specific example in banking. We do a ton of work in finance. It's highly regulated industry. And so everything you do has this, everything creative that you do has this sort of like um, looming threat of, well, what will legal do with it? What happens when legal gets to it? Um, and those are rules. Those are rules on top of the work. Rules serve to actually dissuade people from exploring. And when you say to somebody, no, you can't sleep under your desk, or you say to them, no, you can't do that because legal said so, you're really saying don't take risks. You're really saying don't appreciate a culture of criticism. Uh, don't selectively take feedback from the boss. Um, you're reinforcing this idea that there's a hierarchy and a pecking order and a right and wrong way to do things. Um, it's easier said than done sometimes to get rid of all the rules. And so that really gets to a point of sort of philosophical introspection, which is that if you find yourself at a company um, where every single time you make something new, you're told, well, we can't do that because legal won't let us, you really start to scratch your head and go, is this the right company for me? Um, it is the culture of this place and maybe the culture of the industry such that it limits creativity to a point that I don't actually want to work there. Um, and so back to the original question of, you know, how do you get people over that sort of emotional hump? I think a big, big part of that is saying you have permission in this place to essentially run amok, right? Um, <laughs> we, we hope you we hope you don't. Um, but if you do, it's OK. So is it an instance where it's basically, hey, you have free reign and if you get too far out there, that's when we'll maybe say something, but ultimately let it be more of an exception versus the rule kind of a situation? I mean, maybe I take this to the extreme, but I I actually think (laughs) that at a director or a leadership role, it's your job to block people from the rules. Um, And so I'll I'll, um, let the team do anything um, with the exception of things that are illegal uh, and and let the dominoes fall where they do. But it's on me then as somebody who let them break those rules to take the consequences. Um, and again, those consequences may be harsh. Ultimately, I may get fired, right? And so, you know, to, to sort of go all in on a creative culture has implications, and sometimes those implications aren't what people want to hear. Um, I'll give you an example. It's an example I love to use. Um, one of my colleagues was, you know, unhappy with the thermostat game. Everybody plays the thermostat <laughs> game, yes. right? You know, oh, it's too hot, so I'll turn it down. Oh, it's too cold, I'll turn it up. Um, and so one day we came in and the thermostat was gone. He unscrewed the faceplate and took it. And so now you can't adjust the thermostat um, in a in a corporate setting. You know, imagine doing this at your GE or AT and T or IBM corporate campus. Uh, facilities would come down and and like write you up or something like that. But if they do that, they're saying don't experiment with the space. And again, implicitly, they're saying, don't experiment at all. And so for me, I didn't reprimand him or yell at him or ask him to put the thing back. I sort of said, okay, well, I guess we're stuck with 68 degrees or whatever ridiculous temperature you put it at. Uh, And then waited. And then ultimately, I got a letter from facilities that said, stop taking the faceplate off the thermostat. (laughs) You know, at that point, it's up to me as a leader to go like, okay, and I'll put a new one on. Or you know what? Screw you. This is what we're doing. But either way, it's on me. It's not on the person who took it off in the first place. Uh, Yeah, that's there's a lot of politics involved there for sure. Oh, completely. I mean, the, the entire thing starts to you start to scratch your head around, you know, what makes a company a company? 
Um, and these policies, both the explicit ones, like you cannot do this, but also the implicit ones, like I should not do this, um, are ultimately what would sort of come together to, to indicate if a company is going to work or not. This all kind of flows into this idea that if you are a, quote, creative person or you're hired to be creative, I should say, that when you show up to work, it's almost like it's a, a lever or a button where they kind of demand creativity at a moment's notice, right? And by getting rid of some of these rules, then you're giving or not some of them, maybe all of them, uh, you're giving them the ability to start thinking more freely and coming up with better stuff. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, that uh, again, it's a signal. It's sort of an overt signal that says you can or can't do these things. It's very much like, you know, you're you're not allowed to wear shorts to work except on Fridays. It's like, okay, well, you know, yeah, it's about I like to wear shorts because I'm more comfortable. But again, it's also a message you're sending of we make the rules um, versus you make the rules and you decide when you want to break them. Um, it's interesting that you talked about this, like be creative on demand thing. Um, I think, you know, people, and I'll, I'll use this very loosely, people who are quote unquote creative. Um, and the reason it's loose is because I think everybody is and everybody should be and everybody can be, but, um, you, you find it really hard to turn it on and off and to say, okay, you know, nine to five, I'm going to sit at my desk and I'm going to make stuff. Um, and when we go back to this idea of rules, um, one of the things I've noticed about my employees is, uh, they don't make things during nine to five. Maybe they come into the office at three 30 in the morning. Cause that's when they, it hit them. Um, maybe they don't come in at all cause they have no passion to make anything. Right. Um, you know, I'll look over at some of my staff, uh, at some of the jobs that where I've been in a management role and they're surfing Facebook and they're on YouTube and they're, you know, doing stuff that typically you wouldn't want them doing at work, but I don't yell at them or reprimand them or write them up. Um, cause I recognize that, you know, I, I hired them cause they're good. Um, they continue to be good. And so I'm going to let them work any way they want. I used to have an employee when I was a creative director at Frog Design, uh, which is a consultancy, who would come in whenever she wanted, leave whenever she wanted. She'd literally sleep on her desk. And that was her working style. And it's like, OK, well, you know, that makes it hard to have you come to meetings. It makes it hard to collaborate with you and makes it you know, unexpected when people need to get a hold of you. But you're so good at what you do that I don't care. I'm going to let you do it. Yeah, I mean, does it come down to that, that they're just that good that they earn the, I guess, right to be that way? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think so. <laughs> I think that um, performance matters. Um, for, for me personally, I try to hire people that are at that level because, frankly, I think I'm a bad manager and I don't want to do any managing. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but it, you know, if, if you don't have that level of sort of selection criteria, then, yeah, I think people need to earn – the ability to do that by showing you that that working style works for them, but they don't earn it if you don't give them the runway to earn it. Uh, and so if we start from the idea that you got to be at your desk at nine to five and you earn the ability to be there from you know 10 to four or whatever, then they're never going to be able to illustrate to you that competency got them to earn that right. It, instead, it's going to be like seniority or something like that. And that's not useful. Um, and so I think it's helpful if you start with the idea of do whatever it takes um, and then if you need to, add the limitations that way, um, it's start permissive. And, you know, if, if you end up having to, to back into the sort of more, um, I don't know, conservative style of management. Well, and so culture is made up of people. And I got to wonder, then, how do you, as a self-professed bad manager, how do you deal with the other people who then see in this example, this person sleeping under their desk and coming and going as they please, and they've earned that right, but then... How do the other people work, I don't know, I guess, around that person and say, well, you know, with jealousy and other things that come up like that? Um, you know, again, going, going back to my bad management technique, <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't pick and choose. Um, I've never actually gotten into what we just described as oh, sort of maybe you wow. back into it. Um, I, I let them do what they got to do. And that's not to say that everybody works forever you know, happily forever after. Um, I've had to let people go just like any other manager. And it's usually because of bad, bad performance, because in a culture where there's no rules, then, um, you know, it's very easy to, to say, I'm not going to do any work or I'm not going to come into work because I'm going to abuse the policy. Um, and as best as I try to not hire people like that, sometimes you do. And so I, I think that what gets lost in this conversation is it's still a professional working environment. Um, it's still a company. We still have money to go make. Um, and there's still expectations around what it means to work there. Um, you have to perform and you have to deliver. Uh, and ultimately, for a creative person, delivery is a work product. You need to make things. 
Um, and so uh, I guess I take the approach that if you're making things, you, you could be super hard to work with and that sucks, but you know, you're making good stuff or you could never come into the office and that sucks, but you're making good stuff. Um, and so if you can get to where I need you to be, then do it the way that, that makes you happy. So if I think I hear what you're saying correctly, it's that if these rules aren't in place and people can kind of do things the way they want to, but it still comes down to the product being delivered and it's a quality product, then in the end, everybody that's, quote, co-workers in this creative space and this creative culture are happier. And so some of those problems that would normally come into play don't. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good way of framing it. Um, because for a creative person, no matter the field, the thing you make and the making of it is what gives you so much um, excitement and personal you know, sort of personal satisfaction and ultimately forms your identity. Um, when you talk to people who are artists, you know, they talk about how I have to make things or, you know, I'm stuck in a slump and I haven't made things. And that making is so intertwined with their, their sort of persona and personality. And, you know, the, the further into this creative land you go, um, I think the more satisfaction you get out of actual work product, whether it's yours or somebody else's, um, I think that's also the challenge of people who are, you know, new to a creative discipline is that they make things because they're urged to. And then they look at what they made and they're like, this is terrible because uh, they don't have the skills to match their taste. Often they'll shut down and they'll stop making things. Um, mm. and, and I think that's where you run into um, cultures where people just talk. You know, we've all been in meetings where it just goes around and around um, because nobody's making an artifact, and I'll use that loosely, but some sort of representation of the ideas because no, nobody feels confident to make it. And so a big part of becoming that creative uh, contributor in this, you know, this crazy culture with no rules where anything goes, where you're valued over your work product is coming to terms with that hand skill. And again, I use this loosely. I don't mean you know, drawing. <laughs> when we talk about creativity, I think we often think about like a visual artist and that's part of it. But, you know, again, I'll use the example, an accountant is creative. Um, <laughs> and I don't necessarily mean in cooking the books. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they make things. Um, it's a model, it's a financial model, or it's a power, pre you know, a presentation. And, and so they need all of the same skill and craft and leeway and permission and all of those things that, uh, that anybody else needs. As we're talking about bringing a creative culture into being, you know, birthing it into a company, if it's not been there before, what are some of the other elements that we need to be aware of as we bring that into existence? Um, you know, I think a big one uh, is going to be about judgment of sort of letting go of the fact that uh, if you're in that position to bring it into place, it doesn't mean that you're in the position to decide what's great. Um, you know, I think often we go, and this is particularly true in small and medium businesses. Um, it's my company or, you know, I'm in, in an upper management role. So I'm going to have an initiative. It's going to be, you know, let's call it the creative initiative and I'm going to transform my company. Um, and so I'm going to take pride in the output by taking pride in the output. It probably implies that I'm going to judge the output and I'm going to be the decision maker. And that I, I think that can't be further from the truth. Um, the person who instills this culture almost needs to like by definition, then get out of the way and not be the, you know, the decider. Um, this is most uh, evident, I think, in a very small business or a startup where somebody who is a founder has so much passion and love for the thing they made um, that they just can't let go. And so, you know, I see over and over, actually, designers get hired at a small company um, and they just churn out. They burn out in like six months. And it's because they're micromanaged, this idea of judgment, of coming down on somebody from above. Um, the most vivid example of this is, is typically aesthetics, right? Somebody will look at something somebody made and say, I don't like that. Make it bigger. Make it red. Make it, <laughs> you know, add a drop shadow. And the person says, you know what? Screw you. I'm, go I'm going somewhere where I can actually be creative. And so, you know, the message there, I think, for leaders is um, just because you're the, you know, shepherd of a creative culture doesn't mean you get to be the decider, <laughs> you know, the judger of all things creative. Um, maybe you need to be hands off. Yeah, that's interesting. And, it, and it's not just unhealthy for the leader. It's unhealthy, as you illustrated, for the creative person, because if they're feeling micromanaged and, you know, down to the point where they've got a thumb, they're under a thumb at all times, then again, you're going to get no creative output from them. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, Steve Jobs, for all of his benefits and wonder, sort of created this terrible culture of people who are 
you know, in CEO roles or creative director roles uh, and look at the results he got. His stuff's fantastic. So I'll get fantastic results too. And like at the end of the day, you're not Steve Jobs. The man was magical, right? He was an anomaly. He was, a, you know, a total exception. You know, taking that sort of autocratic, I am the creative visionary approach wh- where I have the answers um, almost always doesn't work. Um, and I talk a lot about creative vision um, and how important it is for a leader to have one. But a creative vision doesn't mean you have the answer. In many respects, it means that you're showing a future, um, an optimistic future that a team can then drive toward. And often that optimistic future is shaped by the work that's already starting to emerge. Um, I'll say that a different way. I find myself telling over and over and over the story of what my, my uh, team has made. Um, and helping them see how I'm contextualizing it in a business story or in a technology story or in a cultural story um, so that they start to see that they made the vision. They made the trajectory um, and that I'm not playing a Steve Jobs role. In fact, in many ways, they are. I know in the book you talk about that and kind of in tandem with this idea of framing. Framing is is a really interesting um, thing that creative people bring to a studio environment. Um, a studio, if you're not familiar with it, is, is the place where a, you know, a, a typical design agency or an art or um, advertising agency works. Um, and it's something that has all of the, the things we just talked about, you know, criticism and freedom and probably a bunch of Nerf darts and beer and things like that. But um, one of the things that I, I um, guide my staff to do and my team when we're in the studio environment is to explicitly frame the problem we're trying to solve. So we'll write on big sheets of paper and big Sharpie, the problem we are trying to solve is, um, and then write it down, and then we'll change it over time, right? It's flexible. And what that means is that we're uh, starting to think critically about the, the job that was given to us. Typically, these, you know, a role comes out of a product, uh, product management playbook and roadmap or out of corporate goals and imperatives, and it's you know, said, you will go, we're going to go make this. Um, But that's not the problem we're trying to solve as a team. Um, When you frame the problem, it actually adds what are called constraints, um, which for creative people are really, really freeing. It seems counterintuitive, but when you add constraints around a problem, it makes the problem tractable. Um, Constraints aren't requirements. This isn't, here's a spreadsheet of things, go do it. Uh, Constraints instead come from the problem themselves. And so when we say we're framing the problem in a certain way. Out of that frame come new rules, new guidelines, new heuristics that then help me focus my creative exploration. Um, I know this is very sort of fleeting and hard to understand, so let me give you just a quick example. Um, when I was working with an educational software company, um, you know, the, the task at hand was to build products that help students. Um, and so that's very big and broad, but it's part of a strategic change to focus on students rather than faculty. Um, Okay, well, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Well, let's drill in and start to understand and empathize with students. They have lots of problems. Um, They have problems studying and registering for classes and things like that. One of the problems they have is with student loans and student debt. Okay, we'll cross out the problem we're trying to solve sign and make it say the problem we're trying to solve is with student debt. Well, what about student debt? Um, Well, you know, we, we identified through research that students are anxious about it. Okay, cross that sign out and write, the problem we're trying to solve is the anxiety around student debt. And each time we cross that sign out and add detail to it and and, um, better frame it, solution ideas, um, new ideas for ways to solve that problem come into into play. Um, And so, you know, constantly sort of wiping and refreshing that framing statement means that we can constantly start to hone our creative exploration. And see, that's interesting to me because we spent so much time earlier talking about getting rid of all the rules, and then we come back in and say, well, no, actually, we can get some of the best creativity by putting some, I don't want to say restrictions because that's not right, but framing things in a certain way. So it's like an expanding and a contracting in a kind of living and breathing environment. Yeah, that's totally right. Um, And and I think the difference is that these rules are coming from the work. Yes. Uh, they're not coming from a, a human. <laughs> and so, you know, they're not coming from the boss who says, I'm smarter than you are. I've gathered the requirements to do this. They're coming through the exploration itself. Um, you know, if I put on my academic hat very quickly, there's a guy named Don- Donald Schoen, and I'm probably mispronouncing his last name. It's S-C-H-O-N with a little dots on the O, um, who researched how creative people work. And one of the things he identified is that creative products have what he called a talk back. They talk back to the creator, meaning I'll make something and I'll look at what I made and looking at it will inform my next move and I'll make it again. 
And so there's this back and forth and back and forth between what I make and what I see and what I make and what I see. Um, and those framing constraints come out of that. They come from that exploration. And so in many ways, as the designer, I own them. <laughs> I, I was the one who established those constraints. I just didn't do it autocratically top down. Um, it emerged bottom up from the work product itself. There's so much more we can talk about. There's so much more in the book. I, I mean, we're scratching the surface here. There's so much more that somebody who is e either top level or honestly, someone who is the creative worker uh, could get out of this book. I want to push people towards the book again. It's called Creative Clarity. Uh, is there any kind of special place you'd like to send people to where they get like examples or bonus content or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I'll give people two uh, two ways to sort of learn more about me and the book. Um, first is my personal website. It's johnkolko.com. That's J-O-N-K-O-L-K-O. -O -O. Uh, and I have a variety of you know text there, things about the book, some other free material. Um, and then the other is my studio, uh, Modernist Studio, M-O-D-E-R-N-I-S-T.com, uh, um, where we do this kind of work, this integration work, this through examples and training for clients. And um, we help people, um, you know, sort of come to terms with and implement a lot of the methods and, and ideas that we've been talking about today. This is a great book. I mean, I'm, I've even just in our conversation, there was stuff that I understood better. So there's there's just a, a depth to what's here in the book that we didn't even touch on here in this conversation. So I would highly encourage everybody to go get it. Uh, John, it's been awesome talking with you. Thanks for being here. Eric, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So I hope now that you've listened to this conversation, you can kind of pick up where I'm talking about, which has to do with having no rules, getting rid of the rules, and how that might play out in certain contexts or cultures and inside certain organizations. Would that work in your organization? I don't know. I don't know that that would work in my organization. I think there's a certain amount of political structure that has to happen, maybe. But I also think getting rid of as many rules as you can or just rethinking how it is you're approaching it could do you some good. If you know somebody who needs to listen to this episode, I, again, I would love for you to, one, head on over to beyondthetodolist.com slash 228. Share it from there. Let somebody know on social, through email, etc. who needs to listen to this and consider it. Maybe it's your boss. Who knows? Maybe it's a, a team member. Thanks again for listening. I really appreciate it. And again, make sure to let me know what you thought of this episode. Go to beyondthetodolist.com slash 228. I will see you there in the comments, and I will see you next episode. <laughs>